Welcome to Show Studio, it's Paris Fashion Week. Um, we have a slightly mini panel today, but all the more better for a focused discussion. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, Paco Rabanne, which is um, getting a huge amount of buzz. There's a lot of journalists very excited about it. Alex Fury wrote a thing in The Independent saying, you know, this is the house to be excited about. Um, their creative de director, Julian De Senna, has a lot of respect within the industry. Obviously, spent a long time at Balenciaga, uh, well, four years at Balenciaga, so I think kind of a designer's designer in some way. There's a lot of support for, for him. Um, it just relating to the kind of buzz around this fashion week with everyone talking about uh, buy now, buy straight from the catwalk. Uh, they've released four looks from this show straight away. So obviously we'll probably talk about that as well in the, the retail landscape. But before we kind of dive into our discussions, I will let my mini panel introduce <laughs> themselves, starting with you, Paula. Um, hi, I'm Paula Reed, creative consultant. Hello, I'm Hetty Judah, I'm a writer and I specialise in fashion and art, or probably art and fashion. <laughs> there is actually a mini Hetty. A mini Hetty? It's a real mini Hetty, yes. What do you mean? There's like a, I've got a mini Hetty. You have like, like a mini version of yourself? Yeah, she's a niece. Oh. Uh, so we have a really mini uh, So she's not a professional threat no, yet? No. Michelle Gaber, the DJ at the men's shows, someone had made a puppet of him and he took it with him to every show. <laughs> <laughs> like, had it next to him. <laughs> It was really funny, and at Valentino I went over and I kissed it before I kissed him. I was like, oh, Michelle. People find it very funny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on to the topic at hand. Why so much buzz around Paco Rabanne? Why, why has this fit worked well? Because you see a lot of these kind of attempts to rejuvenate um, and create fresh press stories around certain houses. You also see a lot of perfume focused houses try and kind of build this fashion reputation it never really worked Paco Rabanne had a real kind of strange setup before Julian uh, De Senna came in you know I think they went through it was like two CEOs in the space of like a really short amount of time why has this clicked or has it clicked um it's been a bit of a slow burn I mean he's mm. been there for a little while I think we were just trying to figure out before we it was came spring, on air. summer 14 was his first season so okay so four that? seasons yeah. maybe yeah. oh god isn't that awful of me thinking oh he's been there for a really long time maybe that's <laughs> a sign of the times there's such a big well he was over. appointed in 2013 so it does feel you know it feels like a long and I think I I was introduced to the brand in 2013 and their head of commercial was saying hey, you know we're so excited about Julian and of course his potted history is, oh, of course he was on Nicolas Gesquier's team. Yeah. And, and left when Nicolas Gesquier left, so it's exactly. kind of a nice story. And I think that team at Balenciaga was, to be honest, I think it was quite big. <laughs> mm. I mean, I think they were, they were uh, you know, it was a fantastically successful team. So there are a few people, you know, in the industry, it's one of those things that you, you certainly sit up and pay attention when, um, you know, you know that they've had that training and that mm. background. And Julian mm. was one of those. So he had the backing of Marianne Lee Sauvé, who's one of yeah. his big supporters. And Nicolas Cotillard is his partner as well, um, which I think, you know, obviously there's a, there's just adds another level to that kind of relationship. And I think that's... Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, the, the industry is demanding it's mm. tough there's a lot of retailers out there who are struggling to create a space for themselves in the market that is different you know point of difference from anybody else so when you hear that somebody is you know you you get those indications that they're mm. really worth looking at then people will absolutely that you know they'll make a beeline for their yeah. door because um, good merchandise is something to treasure. You want to lock in your exclusive as quickly as yeah. possible. And it's interesting because it's the kind of thing where you almost in your head see it as like a new label. Obviously it's not, but you know when you get these designers who've been behind the scenes before, who get an appointment, it almost feels like, it's kind of like when Alessandro Michele started at Gucci, it almost felt like going to see you know, a young designer because it feels very new. But then there is that benefit of the kind of name. And I think Paco Rabanne, because of those perfumes, it's just such a huge name. It's Everyone knows it. It's very mass in that sense. So it's kind of, I think it works well in terms of getting buzz because it's something people are very familiar yeah, with. It can be a millstone as well, though, because Paco mm. Rabanne's not necessarily the most chic association you have with perfume. I mean, it's kind of heavy men's aftershave, and it seems quite Those adverts 80s. are so bad. You know, the one where she's like... Clicking everywhere, those TV ones. Awful. But the power of a brand now, I mean, it's amazing. If you put a good team together for the, to have that brand recognition, is extraordinary. I mean, you yeah. can, no brand is dead now. If it has a kind of an association in the market, 
there's potential to do something with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary. So nobody will discount anything. And, you know, now that Alessandra Michele has been so extraordinarily successful at mm. Gucci, there's not a single person who would take anything for granted, I think. Yeah, Most definitely. people will definitely pitch up and have a look. Yeah. Let's talk about the brand a little bit, just in terms of kind of history and positioning, because we were saying before, you know, he, Julian gave this interesting quote, which, which I thought was, was fascinating. He was talking about... Um, the the arrangement they've done, which is sell these looks on the screen. Now, these are looks from Autumn Winter, so the collection that we're literally about to see, they're already for sale on their website and in their store on uh, Rue Cambon, which is a new store that opened in January. But previously to that, they, they hadn't had their own store, I think it was for like 10 years. Um, so he was talking in relation to that, but the quote he gave was, was he said, Paco Rabanne is a house that has a history of being mainstream and having a direct effect on people. So it's really perfect, so it's a perfect house to work in this way. And it's interesting because I feel like there's two sides to Paco Rabanne. There is this kind of mass side where you think of, you kind of put it alongside, you know, Courage or Pierre Cardin, you know, as these kind of mega names. But then there's also something about Paco Rabanne that is kind of very niche and very innovative and very um, futuristic. You know, think you think metal dresses, you think kind of high design. From the 60s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's and, super interesting. And very youthy. And if I think if you're marketing to the kind of youth in the 60s, you're not going to be, you know, it's going to be separating itself from couture, from tradition. So you're looking at things that are, you know, maybe pushing pushing things in terms of technical fabrics, but that are very wearable. Mm. Is that, it's interesting because obviously we've got the Courage kind of, um, excitement at the moment because they've got their two new designers, Sebastian Mayer and Arnold Veillot. Um, and I was saying before, there's the Met exhibition that's opening, Manus Ex Machina, which is fashion in an age of technology. Is this kind of 60s techie f retro futures? Is that having a moment and why does it feel apt? Well, we're starting to live the dream now, aren't we? Yeah. Because that was all, you know, incredible fantasy about the, you know, the idealistic future. And now when you look, I mean, I was looking the other day at the, you know, the um, Facebook, you know, virtual reality thing. And I thought, oh my goodness, we've, we've got there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because fashions, it's, it is very, like, I think it's quite heavily retro future, isn't it? You know, look at yeah. Nicholas Getzke. Hugely. Yeah. It's Beatles. all about nostalgia and it's yeah. all about romanticism with the, you know, kind of gothic spin on it. This yeah. season, I'm really shocked by how retro it is. So yeah. it'd be super interesting to... You know. But I mean, I think also in design, this happens where people are really informed by sci-fi movies in their design of, you know. Yeah. Even I mean, probably even in stuff at NASA, though, informed by sci-fi movies that you yeah. get this vision of the future, what a spaceship's going to look like, what that amazing Stanley Kubrick or white glossy round-edged thing looks like, which is kind of remarkably like our, you know, the first iPods. Yeah. And, you know, and so it, there is this kind of feed coming in from the first visions of what now would look like and we're and we're lapping it up and we're you know pushing it into our contemporary design mm. i think it was really interesting there was a big um eames exhibition that was just on the yeah which is amazing and if you look at every other so many other aspects of what were going on in the exhibition the kind of backdrops and the the kind of grotty streets and the very old looking cars and yet the design the furniture design and the garments look incredibly fresh they could have been mm. Mm. from now so it's it's interesting how some aesthetics don't age or haven't aged in that way yeah it is interesting because it, one thing that i found about this is is you you look at it and you you immediately think it's very modern but then if you look at what's going on in milan it is so kind of defiantly and forcefully like romantic retro. and it's retro but in a very different way you know kind of cluttered and vintage and whereas i feel like paris maybe because of courage Paco Rabanne, but also i think particularly nicolas gutierre uh, and Vuitton, but also to an extent when Raph Simmons was at Dior, it's it's so it is like that streamlined sky fi thing. It's happening. It's very different aesthetics. I'm hoping for some kind of positivity about the future from mm. Paris because actually in London as well it was super romantic and really yeah. nostalgic and quite, you know, Victorian Gothic costume. You know the workmanship, incredible. And one side I was thinking, oh, well, this is just the most articulate argument against the see now, buy now concept, because yeah. actually there was such an investment in material and craft and artisanship, yeah, and it was like almost as if the designers were sitting at their stall and saying, okay, look, you can't have this immediately, because mm -hmm. it takes a number of man hours to make it, and it takes, you know, weeks and months of research to actually get to this place. You can have it right now. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have that instant gratification, which seems to be perfectly acceptable, you know, if you're in the car industry 
or any other, pretty much any other industry, we mm. were obsessed with this, you know, see it and I buy it and I have it. Mm. Um, but at the same time, we did, what I couldn't gel with that was, you know, you look at the, you know, the Eames exhibition, incredible positivity about yeah. the future. I mean, they saw this, you know, kind of utopian vision and we have incredible negativity about our future. And that yeah. is, you know, perfectly understandable possibly with the kind of, the way the economy is going, you know, the geopolitical situation, mm. all of that just seems like there's an awful, you know, Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> there's an awful lot of kind of instability around and maybe that, because isn't fashion the great barometer of our yeah. times? And it, fashion, it is, it's so kind of head in the sand at the moment, fashion, isn't it? It's kind of like, but yeah, I... Yeah, it's like, la, 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 yeah. I don't want to know. But I see it as much, you know, the houses that are doing the kind of Victorian or kind of very cluttered vintage look... I agree that that is it's so nostalgic, but I also think you could you could say that this kind of futuristic fashion is also kind of nostalgic in the same way. I mean, I, the last time we saw this huge rush of very futuristic fashion was just before the the turn of the century, of course, yeah. when there was this huge rush of everything being techno fabrics yeah. and silver and reflective, and and so I guess there's part of this is also like a nineties nostalgia. Yeah, well. that's super interesting. I was thinking about that a lot. It's this kind of the cycles of fashion, but do you not also think I feel like techie fashion has never really just, it's never really found a place or looked chic. You know, you see a lot of designers who work, it's kind of like, and this is awful to say, it's kind of like ethical or sustainable fashion where people have this like aesthetic idea of what it's going to be like. They're like, oh, that'll be all kind of floaty or hemp or furry. Yeah, you know, you have this idea that it's (laughs) like, that it's a certain way. And I think it's kind of the same with things that are made out of kind of innovative fabrics or that they're 3D printed or, you know, that they have... It's like anything wearable tech. You well, it's think hard that to the sit design... down in that stuff. Yeah, you I mean, do... ultimately, it's the body that informs what design is. Yeah. It's got to fulfil a function. And it's hard to sit down in metal with a plexiglass helmet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting at the men's shows because uh, Junior Watanabe put um, solar panels on some of the coats. And I thought that's actually the first time that a designer who's seen as being very kind of just fashion, you know, like real fashion did something that was like really, really wearable tech. Were they functional? Yeah, they were functional. I don't think that any they charge your iPod into, or something? Yeah, they charge you, I guess, like, uh, <laughs> oh, I know, I can charge do something up. But it is strange that wearable tech and fashion have just never merged. Like, you think brands are investing so much. It in, is, it is happening. Fast, because is I, I had a little insight into, yeah, because wearable tech has always been, you know, it's like a lead coming out. I mean, yeah. If it's clunky, if it is not seamless, people don't want it. Because yeah. why would they? Our lives are complicated enough as it is to yeah. remember to plug yourself in, for God's sake. <laughs> But I had a um, was lucky enough to go to a, a conference in Barcelona last December, and there was a presentation on a project that um, Google are working on. Um, and they highlighted in particular a Savile Row collaboration. Mm. I think it's called Project Jacquard. I mean, I, I don't think I'm giving away any state secrets here, <laughs> um, which might be worth. I, I ran, and I still wanted to kind of further investigate that. Yeah. I've got so round is it to multiple it. fibers. To say. It's yeah. amazing. It's kind of com- yeah, responsive fibers, but it's all woven into mm. the garment. It That's looks like a perfectly normal normal garment. Yeah. garment. Yeah. What I'm surprised hasn't taken off is more things like thing, like you think all these luxury bag companies and they're trying to find a story with their bags and it's always surface driven but I think you know touch charging is really normal now put your phone down on that and it'll charge it why aren't there handbags that charge your phone just when you put them in like things like that like kind of kind of normal tech stuff that's not about you know being able to like light yourself up or anything weird, <laughs> you know because you often think about that I don't understand why that's not taking on I don't understand why because I think people expect so much from their technology, but they just... I think Apple Watch was the first thing that fashion really kind of engaged with. In Maybe a, it's because they don't see it as being very fashion. Because, I mean, Apple Watch was a bit of a, a failure. failure. But yeah. then it was Star everywhere. States. Like, it was yeah, on the yeah. cover of, I think it was Vogue China. Like, you know, Hermes did the... Yeah, I wonder why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, on the cover of magazines, you have to wonder what the commercial collaboration was behind that. But actually, in terms of uptake... Until Hermes did the collaboration, I don't know. I yeah, don't know I'm a not, single person who's You don't see people interested. wearing them at fashion. No. And I, the, I don't know anyone who's bought one who wasn't either gifted one for like no, an exactly. extended period of no, time. There was or, extensive gifting and yeah. a lot of money behind it. So, yeah. But the actual uptake is still, I don't see it. No, it seems to have mm. kind of fallen off the radar completely. And like mm. the Google Google Glass. Yeah, that was. I mean, just no dropped, matter how yeah. much money they threw at that and put it on catwalks in New York, it still didn't happen. So, yeah. unless people. Love it and find an emotional connection to it, then you 
<laughs> yeah. I also think sometimes it, it's aiming too big. It's like, it, that's what I mean with the small things, like, you know, something that can charge your phone easily or something that... You know, Richard Nickel did a bag where you could charge, charge your, your phone. phone. Do you yeah. remember that? It's yeah, it's that quite, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but he also did a lot of stuff with, with different kind of fabrics that would change, cut, you know, things like that. Yeah. He was kind of investigate, but obviously like his But you had to now. plug your bag in to charge yeah. it and yeah, then it charged it. It wasn't the, yeah. what, what did you call it? The, With the flat charger. I don't know what's actually called. Yeah, you call it something much more technical, it. but it wasn't that. It, yeah. You had to plug it in. Yeah. And tell me, let's just go back a little bit to talking about what they've done with their buy now or show now, buy now, whatever it's called. There's See so many different now, terms. Think, yeah. We had Rosanna Faulkner from, she's business director at Matthew Williamson, and she was talking about the difference between buy now, show now, buy now, or buy now, get now. So she was like really explained it really well. And it was just too much for me. I was like, <laughs> don't understand. But what do we think about doing four looks? Um, because also what they've done as well, which I should say, is they've done a campaign shot by Patrick de Marchelier and styled by Marie Amelie Sauvé, who obviously works very closely with Nicolas mm. Casquier, so as you said, as part of the kind of family. And this, it's very similar actually to the Loewe model, where it's like, because what Jonathan Anderson does at Loewe and along with his collaborators, um, M.M. Paris and, and Stephen Meisel, is when you go to see the shows, the there's already a campaign featuring that season that is everywhere in Paris. You know, it's up on billboards, it's up on... Like, you know, they always have it on like phone boxes, what have you, on the streets, everywhere. A very similar model to what they've done here. It's this kind of um, quite kind of small niche campaign, but they've plastered it absolutely everywhere. Um, so it's an extension of the marketing, which the yeah, show but, is, but giving it a customer facing. Yeah, and giving you your taste of the mood of, yeah, and, and the, I guess a wider sense looks, of what they're trying to do. With it's it. interesting because when they do cool. it, you, when you're in Paris, you really feel like it's a way of making people more aware that it's fashion week it feels like that but i i just wonder is it confusing messaging to make four looks available that's I mean, what i find strange because i think you know because already i mean i find it difficult i, I never know where i'm <laughs> spring summer 17 yeah is it 16 when's pre i mean really am do I you ever forget what year you're in because you're so used totally. to working in the fashion i forget calendar. what age i am but that's quite <laughs> handy i have to come back <laughs> i'm always making myself older but, than i really yeah, am so, i think because fashion makes you wish yeah you're always old. ahead you're I'm always, always like, ahead yeah. I think, well, actually no i'm not that age yet that's phew, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny but i mean this looks like fun. it's a lovely campaign it's fantastic but we're all talking about it yeah i'd love to see some of the sell-through numbers on these things because yeah <laughs> i'd really love to well apparently cause... the prada bags that they, they did two bags that you could buy straight from the catwalk this season apparently they sold out like oh, okay. in a day okay i don't know if that was from but, one yeah. of the stores the bag is also such a different such a different totally different yeah, yeah. And it doesn't look, it's not the most accessible. If we go, do you mind just going on the retail page, Brits? Um, that looks like a big shirt dress, though. Yeah. Like, well, the, the knit is kind of, so when you click on their ready to wear. Um, well, what kind of price is it? Yeah, it's exactly. so expensive. So that knit is like a thousand pounds. Okay, that's crazy. Pounds, for, I think. Um, for a pull and yeah. knit Yeah. And so that's the offering. It's small. You get the nylon skirt, which is, I haven't got my glasses on. This is a disaster. <laughs> 610, then, what's the star shape, the star printed, the gal galactic looking thing? Sorry, this is the... It's embroidered satin dress, which is 4,000. 4, 4,000 euros. They ha he has talked about trying to do more furs and embroidery as a way of kind of pushing a new kind of element for the... But even, like, I'd say the knit is the most kind of basic thing there, and that's 900. But do you think then he's given himself an out because they're evidently not going to sell thousands of these at that price? So they can then just make 10 of each. That's and kind of probably How satisfying. Much is that? That's 4,400. He said, yeah, I wonder about that, but he said that these were kind of the pieces that define the collection, you know, define mm -hmm. the aesthetic of the collection. So I don't feel like they've released... They're extraordinary. I mean, I think they're beautiful, beautiful pieces. And, you know, it would be fabulous to own any of that. But somebody... I mean, I, I have a little bit expo of exposure to the business and what it's like right now. Yeah. Please, somebody, show me where are these customers... Like literally rattling the you know the the locked gates yeah. to spend four thousand pounds on a coat. Who, where are they? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think most most retailers are working really hard to engage with them. They are not. They're not. There aren't droves of them. They're not scattered and everywhere. What, do you think part of the problem also is this like monumental success of the contemporary labels? So something like Acne, which is just kind of, I think people see it as fashion and cool, but it's you know you can get 
it, it's cheap, you know, it's, it's, no, it's, not, it's cheap. not that cheap. It was no. not cheap, cheap, but it, it hits in terms of high fashion. It, it goes to it's the top end of the high street. It's yeah. achievable and it's got a really strong fashion point of view, but at the same time, it's very much a part of your everyday wardrobe. Yeah. They've got a really great formula going. Mm. I'd love to know. Do you remember Donatella did Versus in exactly this mm. model? I mean, yeah. she's kind of, nobody's really talked about yeah. Versus because it's all the, the publicity has gone to what Burberry and you know Tom Tommy Ford, Hilfiger yeah. and Tom Ford are doing. But last season, Donatella was already exploring yeah. that. Because they, they put it straight on, I can't remember where else it was Versus in the UK. went straight into the stores. Yeah, and it was the whole collection as mm, well, The whole collection. It? So I'd love to know how that worked. I, but Versus, again, it's a bit cheaper. So it kind of feels mm. like it kind of is that Moschino. Well, Moschino were the kind of the originals in, in doing this and with them you know it, it feels like it's a bit more kind of playful whereas I wonder if there's what's interesting with this is it's none of it is gimmicky you know like I kind of admire that they've done ready to wear it's not like the Prada thing of you know you can buy a couple of handbags but I do wonder as you say like the shopper who likes this and probably the shopper who's going to engage with Paco Rabanne I wonder if they want that immediate thing or whether especially now they've got a store whether that shopper is going to operate a bit more slowly and wants to kind of I mean there is definitely still kudos to being the person that's got a piece first although I guess it undermines it a bit knowing that it's available like this and you didn't actually have to go and sleep for somebody to get hold of it yeah <laughs> um, but I mean I think I mean Paula you can answer this probably much better than I can but I mean if you're talking about a brand where they have hundreds of stores worldwide Presumably, if you're saying, okay, we're going to make this collection available in the shops, you're actually exposing yourself financially much more than you are saying, okay, we're going to make these available, these 4,000 euro pieces, and actually you're not having to produce that many. So, in fact, they're getting quite a lot of headlines. They're getting some lovely billboards. Mm. They're getting us talking about it, but actually it's not that much. It's not a massive financial exposure. exposure. Mm. What do we think about the fact, because he made, um, Julian Desenor, who was speaking about this, made the point that they weren't able to do this for because we didn't have a store. He actually said that. We weren't able to do this for because we didn't have a store, but now that we have retail, we can really control and distribute the clothes in the e-shop and in the proper shop mm. in Paris. I'm very enthusiastic to work in these different areas because we are super free in this brand to build and to grow. What do you think about about this? Because And it's really interesting to get your opinion on this, because we're seeing people very much, a lot of it, particularly young brands, really try and pull back and do their own, you know, sell through themselves. Like, eat, like... Brands that are young, young, Why so like Nazir Bazaar and, yeah. and people like that, you know, even it's really the norm to have e commerce now. Mm. If you think, I always think about Christopher Kane, you know, the fact that he didn't engage with any of that stuff and didn't even have a website. And I think, you know, you couldn't do that now. You know, it's someone straight away, like Lou Dalton, yeah. all of those young, Claire Barrow, Marcus Almeida, they've really put effort into But you into can time. understand why, because it's a huge amount of work. I mean, it's not like just doing a blog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and getting a bit of WordPress and then just, you know, putting it out there. It's like opening a store. It's like opening a flagship store. And that is a common um, misconception about the internet, that you can just kind of you know that it's easy that it's fine it's really not easy and i can and it's big and to do it right and yeah. to make sure you've got your customer service right and that you've got all your logistics right because if you don't have it right you're literally going to fail from day one yeah so it's it's a beast it really is a beast it might look simple but it's really not simple but then the freedom that you get the flexibility you mm -hmm. know as as julian is talking about you know through a flagship store and then the backup of your e-commerce mm. is really something worth fighting for yeah. it's really something worth investing in mm. especially now and e-commerce gives you that opportunity to actually develop exclusives and then give them a platform yeah. and then be able to talk about them in exactly the way you want to talk about them mm. you don't have to go and do staff training in some store in downtown you know god knows wherever and hope that they understand your yeah. vision yeah you make direct contact with your customer. It's a fantastic freedom if you can make it work for yourself. And what do you think, because we've kind of seen this trend for this happening coincide with the kind of enormous success of these multi-retailers, particularly online ones, so things like Matches Fashion when mm. they rebranded, and, and obviously like Net is the obvious, the obvious example, but tons of others, My Teresa, loads of them. What is going to happen? Is the, are these both going to grow in tandem or are we going to see some brands trying to pull away from being in monthly retail? This is the big question. <laughs> what what happens good? to the bricks and mortar boutiques as well? Because they end up basically just getting left as the kind of ugly cousin really. Well, they? no, because they, they should become more beautiful because then they should yeah. become the showrooms of the, yeah. you know, that's yeah. where you go and do, you know, you, you touch, you feel, you experience, you try on, you get, yeah. you know. And then you buy it cheaper And online. then you buy it online. Well, I think it's completely cheaper, flipped. It's... Do you remember, I think it used to be. That it's called you showrooming, would... isn't it? Yeah, like, but you go now you go to a store for research I think it used to be that you went online for research and you went to the store to buy and mm. now it's completely go to the store to 
check things out and then you buy it online and you do all the comparisons but i mean there was a rumor doing the rounds about a year ago when i was at my teresa and i'm not going to mention names because it really was a rumor and it could have been gossip and i've got nothing to back it up <laughs> that a major major label had told a major multi-brand online retailer that they were going to withdraw most of their product from the online retailer because they had developed their own e-commerce to such a degree that they felt that they had the adequate platform to do it themselves. Mm. And for a while, when we were discussing, it was like, oh, really? Mm. <laughs> and the, it makes perfect business sense. Yeah. If you think about it, if you have actually, if you feel confident in the fact that you've reached your customer, now for some brands who haven't invested as much in their own e-commerce and can't with as much confidence say that they have a deep and meaningful yeah. and strong connection with their customer, then I can see why they want the sophistication of the multi-brand who are way ahead yeah. of Yeah, and will help with press of and what All of them. Yeah. But for somebody who really feels they've got their act together, why would they not take that margin back? Yeah, that's what I think. That's what I don't... And I also think, you know... The whole multi-brand retailer thing existed because of this notion of convenience. Because if you think bricks and mortar, it was much more convenient to be able to go to one store, browse and have lots of choice. Yeah. But online, it's like so easy to go. It's just as easy to be browsing through matches and clicking from page to page to page as it is to be going on the Saint Laurent website and then going on the Givenchy website. It's a click. Do you know what I mean? So it's so easy. And I wonder, I wonder if it's, if it's going to be changing habits, I think there's definitely a certain generation who, if they want to buy fashion, go to a des like still online, go to a destination. But I wonder if a younger. But there's also the, I think the idea of editing is extremely absolutely. important because yeah. actually it becomes overwhelming. The curation is yeah. Really you know, if you're absolutely. out there going right, I want some kind of showstopper dress that's mm. going to define the way I look this season. You suddenly are just hit by this tidal wave of stuff <laughs> that you just yeah. kind of can't get through. And possibly, you know, obviously we have the leisure to a certain extent to go through all of the collections by younger designers. If you're, you know, an average, well-informed consumer, you don't necessarily have that time. You're not, not necessarily out there cruising through these collections. And so it's really important to have, you know, whether it's Hostam or LNCC or Machine A or mm. Teresa or whatever, somebody whose vision you find exciting, you think might challenge you from a fashion perspective and whose you know take you'll appreciate and you feel it will provide you with like a really tight edit of things that you might want to be associated mm. with absolutely do we think that Paco Rabanne at this stage have enough of a kind of awareness and excitement to make obviously the new store is, is very new opened in January to, have, to make people go on their own e-commerce platform and buy from there or do you think it's a tricky one in that sense because I can imagine the store will get footfall because it looks interesting, it's beautifully designed. And people will walk in. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really great, iconic location. But the opportunity, on the other hand, for the brands, I think, in e-commerce, is you should be able to develop special product for your yeah. website. You should, if you have a you know cult following, whether you're Paco Rabanne or Max Mara, mm. you should be able to have your... That should be the place where everybody knows they can go and find everything. So somebody's dedicated to find you know, the latest from Paco Rabanne or the quintessential Max yeah. Mara camel coat, they should be able to go to either one of those websites and be absolutely sure that they're going to find but it there, I've... plus all the added extras, yeah. plus, 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 you know, the exclusives and the special stuff that they're working on. You know, there is a real opportunity. But that's really hard because I did a piece, it was about a year ago for the FT, but it's probably up online, which was about the demands that retailers were putting on brands for exclusives. So it got to the point where brands were having to like produce yeah, all their collections really hard. as well as doing yeah. all these. And I kind of think how do, are brands going to have the space to do something kind of exciting and exclusive on their own website if they're producing like, you know, a denim capsule for one retailer mm. and like a you know charity t-shirt thing for another you know there's always those things and 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 all the retailers are saying the same thing that the customer wants it like it, they want something new but look different. at what jonathan anderson is doing for example in um the shirt range yeah do you? It's well no the the little store the tiny uh, little yeah. thing that, that i'm um, like yeah, yeah it's like the exactly. workshop and, and it's you know it's like it's almost like looking at his imagination working yeah and you know the product of that imagination it's a kind of small and little and special and it's not massive runs it's all kind of particular and yeah. i think that's super smart i love that idea and that makes me you know, excited to see it. Mm. You'd make a pilgrimage for that, I think. Yeah. But, but I also look at him and think, how do you not burn out? I mean, the amount of stuff that's coming out of... Oh, they make them strong in Northern Ireland. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's, he just works really far ahead. I think yeah. that's the big thing that people don't talk about him enough, is he makes stuff like 
like he's always ahead. He's never like late on a collection. Right. Like it's finished. He works really, really. But also fast. things become so homogenous and everything's available. That special. I mean, I understand what you mean. And all retailers, absolutely, they're putting more and more demands on designers mm. for personal appearances and exclusives. Mm. And when I was talking about to um, the Telegraph about the launch of Boutique One in April, mm. which we're all beavering away to make happen in Sloan Street. Um, the first question they ask: What are your exclusives? Yeah. Not yeah. what you know. Not what is your point of difference in terms yeah. of your curation or your customer service or anything. Yeah, things that really matter. But what are your exclusives? Yeah. And that's all they were interested in. I do. I wonder if that is also part of the something that brands aren't re- aren't realizing enough is that something like brilliant customer service as a kind of special exclusive thing more important than anything it's else. so important more important than but i anything wonder else. why have no physical stores done something like be like we ha- i know there's personal shopping and stuff but like having like a stylist there that feels you know something like really matches are generally pretty good with that kind of yeah, thing i mean they shopping. for a really long time i mean i know with men's work that whenever my partner used to go in here you get handed champagne or a cup of coffee even if you don't buy anything you've you never bought anything i hate that though because then you feel like feel, you have to buy something i always feel really beholden i know really. you feel so mm. awful. is it coming then i think you know if you go somewhere and you're like I just, I, my favourite is Mimi. I bought some shoes there the other day, and as soon as I was like, I'll have them, they were like, Champagne for the lady. And I was <laughs> oh, like, yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> it was really nice because I was like, celebrated my shoes, but also I didn't, they hadn't done it when I'd gone in, so it was like, I didn't feel like. So it wasn't too much of a hard Yeah. Song. I love buying stuff there, it makes me so happy. <laughs> See, it works. It really does. But yeah, there are really small things, rush. like, you don't have to, you know, ply people with champagne necessarily, but, you know, things like, the way you're greeted, the way you're looked yeah. after. You know, if you ask for something in the in the in the um, you're you know you're stuck in the changing room, they don't disappear, so that you don't yeah. have to come out in your pants and ask for a different yeah. selfies. Yeah. You know that there's a bell in the changing room that you get somebody's attention. Yeah. That you know the follow up is really good. That your credit card is handled really quickly. Because that's really what quickly. I often think in these big. It is the big multi brand stores. Is I understand why people would make a pilgrimage to something like the Paco Rabanne store because when you're in something that big where there's like these incredibly expensive products are just kind of on rails amongst so much other stuff whereas if you at least if you go into something like a space like this and you are spending like we said you know four thousand four hundred on a code it's hung there like it's a museum object you're going to be the the attention of the whole store whereas i kind of feel like if you go into you know like a big like a harrods or harvey nichols that that experience is not quite the same you don't feel like what you've bought is so so special so i understand why this is appealing well you're in the world of the designer yeah exactly first hand getting exactly what is turning him or her on at that mm. particular moment it's really immediate what do we think is what do we think is the kind of big thing in retail that people need to be doing better because obviously everyone's i think because this season the story has been you know buy straight away you know buy straight from the catwalk it's kind of everyone's acting like that's the thing you have to do service but do you, is that what's letting Absolutely, and I'm kind of shocked at how expensive everything is, and then how rubbish the service is. Yeah, and I, you know, I kind of walked in, walked into Sloan Street. I'm not going to say the shop either. Desperate to buy a pair of shoes, and I was kind of in, feeling a little, a little bit defeated because the weather, and and I got a taxi, and I saw it. I'd already spent too much money, and and ah, and, <laughs> and I walked in. Maybe I just looked like a mess, and they didn't think I was yeah. really going to buy, <laughs> gonna buy anything. anything. And they were talking really loudly about what they were going to do that evening. And I thought, well, that's a bit rubbish. And I couldn't make eye contact, so yeah. I backed off. So yeah. they absolutely lost sale because I was ready to buy the shoes. Yeah. Yeah, it happens a lot. I got the worst service ever on Mount Street where I bought a bag. It was Balenciaga. I bought a bag. I'm just going to name them. And I went in and I was like, oh, this bag is broken. It broke after like three months. And I was like, can you like help me fix it? And she was literally like, wait. And she made me wait for like 15 minutes, literally stood there. So you feel like a criminal. Yeah, and, and then it happened in Celine where one of my friends bought a purse and it broke. And she went in and the first thing they said to her is, is this real? And she was like, um, what? But and it, if you can't tell, what's the point in having a real Yeah, one? it was insane. But the worst There's thing was... There's also a way to find out. You yeah, know, may I just have think, suspicions, yeah, but you don't you interrogate don't say. your customer. The worst thing in Balenciaga, it made me really, really sad because <laughs> I think maybe they were having an off day. I don't want to, like, sully the reputation of Balenciaga. But, like, 
they were so so rude and then I got to put I got so frustrated and I, I felt like a real twat doing it but I said I actually work in fashion and as soon as I said that they were like like fuck she's gonna email the PR or something so they fixed <laughs> it for me for free like you know before they'd been like we can recommend a leather yeah, that's person. terrible and, also. Uh, but it made me so sad because I thought imagine if I'd been a young girl that yeah. had saved up all my money it was a black Guys, leather bag. Every, anybody watching just follow that it made me say so, I work in fashion it was so bad but them. it made me so sad because I thought imagine if you'd saved up and you'd bought something and it'd it's broke dreadful. it but it's I really also thought dreadful. the stupid stupidest thing with it was even I'd already kind of been frustrated by the product breaking obviously that's bad like really bad because it's an expensive price point but if I'd have gone there and they'd fixed it to me really if like efficiently and effectively I actually ironically would have probably been more inclined to buy something from them again even yeah. though their product had broken because I knew that they took care of you but oh so I feel so pathetically grateful always <laughs> once they've got me they've really got me. really and I and I well I think that's partly because you are we are so used to bad service yeah and I think somehow people think it's just acceptable that you're treated like a second class citizen when you go yeah. into these stores don't you think I mean I can see our St Martin's um, audience, we're all nodding in agreement, so yeah. we're not talking complete rubbish. But then but... it's interesting that someone like, you, I, what I've, I, I think the most in, one of the most interesting retail things that happened this year was the Simone Rocha store and the way that's been done because they've really made it almost like a museum. You know, there's so much stuff in there in terms of installation, what's in the window, like they've got a car in the window. Mm. I, I want to say at the moment, I haven't been in there for about two weeks, and and you know I, the staff in there, firstly, are amazing and lovely. But also, they were saying they people see the car and get excited and go in. So what they're doing is using it like an advert, of like a, a museum. Good idea. But they must get so many people walking to that store because they see a car covered in flowers who would never buy anything. And it's such a different model to something like a lot of the stores on Mount Street, where it's like it's all the clothes. You open the door and they expect you know there's no kind of just come in and have a look. Like it's, I think that's what needs to happen with physical stores is they need to feel like a that you're welcomed and like the people yeah. in them are excited by what is in the store and they want to share it with you and yeah. they want to communicate yeah. why this is really special so that maybe you don't buy something then but in five years time when you get a bonus exactly. or you want to buy something for a special occasion that's where of you go course. back to because yeah. you've been dreaming about it for and that long. And to be perfectly honest when was the last time you were in Mount Street and there were so many people in the store that you thought the poor staff are so busy yeah, and I just know, don't exactly, have time. Exactly. So frankly if I was them I would be you know, really happy to see people so that I can have a chat with somebody yeah. and not be standing around feeling yeah. like, you know, when's my But it does, break? you feel like it's a red gem when you find, if you do go into a store and they're really helpful yeah. and really great, you are like, wow, they remember, and that, yeah. that should be the norm. Because also in this age where everyone buys stuff online, like that is one of the only things that physical stores have to offer. Yeah. Especially because actually the service in, in online stores is really like, good you know you can get things the same day you can get so, so convenient I mean I think that was one of the things that I really took away from my Teresa was that the investment in I mean with German efficiency in their customer service so their customer service room has got I don't know like 16 people in it all of them completely fluent in five different languages Jesus. working 24 hours a day 365 days of the year. So the head of customer service, God help her, a really hard working woman, yeah. did Christmas Day by herself. Oh, oh my, my God. Amazing. Yeah. Really, really amazing. Because that's what you want it to be like. Like you want to be able to ring at like any time and know what's going on. And it, I think people just have those expectations. Like they're much higher now. Absolutely. And why not? Yeah. That is really hard earned money. And you need to, it's a considered spend. Mm. How dare anybody take it for granted that you're going to hand over £1,500 and be treated like a second-class citizen yeah. when you do it. I'm sorry. No, those days are over. Yeah. Let's talk about the Paco Rabanne collection because we can now see it, which is oh, nice. Oh, And we've already obviously had a big preview because we've seen the looks that are available to buy straight away. Um, what do we... When, when I, I love his work because I think it's super exciting just in terms of it reminds me of when and I don't mean that he copies in any way but obviously it reminds me of when Nicholas Gisquier was at Balenciaga it's that feel you know it's that kind of there's always like a weird hardness and it's quite I think it's quite chilly but in a, in a really seductive way so I love it and I feel like it feels very different I think partly as we were saying because of how romantic everything else is what, what's what's our thoughts on it? What do, and also, Hetty, I'm going to pick on you as our kind of history expert, but what do you think, when you say Paco Rabanne, what are the aesthetic codes that you it's, think Well, of? it's that hard shininess, actually. It's yeah. funny that you were mentioning that at Pinocchio Yoga because it seems like a very natural fit, so that kind of a, the slightly unwearable, unflexible, yeah. 
kind of well unwearable astro it's warrior. the 12 unwearable dresses isn't it that's the thing it's like you think i do that dress looks super wearable I want that right now. But then the, he's, he, there are these kind of what look like quite interesting flexible carapaces and slightly thicker material going over the top of things that are making what look like um, breastplates and things mm. as well. That's that coat that you can buy straight mm. away. But with white boots as well, which is quite something. That's the boots like, look kind of great. I wonder yeah. if that's a kind of Velcro... Yeah, that I'm kind of into it. it. almost looks a bit motocross, but... Yeah, 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 or astronauts or something. Yeah, but motocross. It's just, I, I, what I find very interesting is because he he talks about it being sky fi and he talks about the kind of you know futuristic and what have you, so it's it's very interesting to me that the two avenues that they're pushing into are embroidery and furs, which you're seeing here a lot of a big story in this collection, because those are almost things that feel completely removed, like from anything hard or futuristic or minimal. Well, you yeah, know, Paula was talking earlier about this idea of having woven in wires and things. So actually embroidery is potentially something very, very mm, futuristic. Yeah. Things you can mm. do with embroidery. And he's also had some wonderful textured fabrics that have really kind of picked out all kinds of amazing things. Yeah. So you, there's embroidery there which is covered in, like, you know, Botticelli flowers and there's futuristic embroidery, oh, oh. certainly. Just on the note of fur, why is fur selling so well? at the moment it's everywhere and I it, it, particularly in London and there was quite a bit written about this because I think you know you see those fur companies offering a lot of sponsorship a lot of kind of incentives to young designers to use the fur but obviously does the consumer want it because it seems like it's everywhere well because it's everywhere people are buying it so yeah they do want it yeah I mean, it's massively controversial, so... But the, the other, I mean, it's the, there's also that kind of texture, I think, the way it it moves, because even if you were vehemently anti-fur... I mean, what I went to um, Brunello Cuccinelli's presentation in Milan mm. last week, and the way they can tease cash, uh, cashmere so that it yeah. looks like, like, you know, yeah. a kind of 3D, fuzzy, furry thing. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. So it's a kind of, you know, I think people do respond to that but yeah. yeah there's a lot and the way sheepskin is being used right now um there's a yeah there's a lot but was it that huge boom in the russian luxury market that happened you know back you in the beginning at... century and now that's kind of fallen off but maybe there's still this i mean i think the anti fur lobby in this country is probably one of the strongest in the world but you go on any bus or any tube so yeah. you're looking at a real cross-section of society and i think you can see you know a, a significant number of the women and men they're actually, yeah. you know, wearing fur. So, yeah. you know, you have to talk to them and what, you know, why, what their reasons are, but yeah. they're buying it's it. An, it's interesting. I think, I think part of it also is, is just when you, when it's shown in so much in the work of young designers, then it's in trend pages, it's in magazines and it kind of continues this idea of being, yeah. you know, it was all over the JW Anderson collection. You know. But is that not what he's done there? Is that not sheepskin? It looked to me like it might be. Yeah. Can we go back a little bit? Because we've kind of zoomed Forward, I wouldn't okay? have thought that. Was... I think it's a, t a really t fascinating technical challenge for a lot of young designers as well. When yeah. I, I, mean, I was talking to Thomas Tate when he was just he'd just gone over to his mandatory trip to to, you know, to work with fur, and I think just the idea mandatory he, well, he... you know not mandatory <laughs> you know, I mean as in like everybody gets kind of yeah pulled in to go and you know by the, was it the Nordic Fur Council whatever it is yeah yeah, oh, I, don't, um, yeah I don't know and and but I think just the idea that you've got this. You know, this material that you can't waste any of, and they, yeah. they trim it so thin each individual piece, and the way that it's um, uh, God, my brain's completely going <laughs> <laughs> kind of collage together so it looks like a kind of seamless thing. In fact, when each pelt is so tiny, I mean, I think technically it's something that probably if you've got that slightly nerdy edge, yeah, it's, it's almost irresistible to, to be scared yeah. of kind of... See, that to me looks like sheepskin, yeah. Like... Mm. And the coat as well. Can we get back to the coat? Sorry. I'm kind of obsessed with that coat now. I think, I think Paula is as well. Yeah, I'm on it. It's quite good, isn't it? It reminds me, you know, the, the classic Joseph it, ones. Yeah. Like the, it reminds me of that, obviously. I just love that kind of 70s, a bit kind of, you know, super, super fly. Is that kind of silhouette. It's the strange mix, though. Of I, what I find interesting in this collection is the kind of historical references. So like you were saying, like the kind of breastplates, the look of armour. We see that a bit a bit later if we keep scrolling through. Sorry guys, I don't know. I know poor <laughs> Brit's like <laughs> sick to death of the collection yeah. already. <laughs> but like particularly in that look number ten, you know the it, kind of leather bust, yeah. But then mm. so sixties, you know the pocket, can you wait, I don't know if it is a pocket or just a detail, but that kind of square yes, yeah. rectangular detail. Well there's a lot of respect for the heritage of the house, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. 
Not much silver, though. And I always... There were some silver boots at the beginning. At the it beginning. Def- there were definitely some silver go-go boots. Those are the trousers that are available straight away. I'm definitely feeling kind of late 90s coming through on this as well. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Definitely. It's not just that kind of 60s it's thing. It's no, I don't think it's... It's a different sensibility. It's, it's like there is a grunginess to it. Definitely. Is there a piece around the shoulder? I can't quite see in number 15. Yeah, it's... Have those we got sh- any close-ups yet, Brett? Those shoes look cool, too. So there's tra- something interesting going with the footwear, isn't there? Mm, the I mean, trainer or yeah. love or something, I don't know. What I'm interested in is who will this woman be... Who's into this? You know, is it the woman who also, like... There's the minimalness, so is it the woman who also buys, you know, Celine and the row, or is it the woman who is into kind of design and buys Vuitton or... You know, Christopher Kane or something like that. That's what I can't quite. And these look like hardworking pieces. A lot of them. I mean, that bomber jacket mm. there. With the, you know, you can imagine these being things you wear. You know, every other day in a season or something. But do you not but think the woman who would go to quite... it? Yeah, exactly. The one who goes to it probably is that thing of like you almost want a pee. You want to make the point that you're wearing back yeah. a band, like. And is this a return of his chain mainly kind of because he had that golden chain? Oh, yeah. Is yeah. that yeah. that red? Yeah, it looks yeah. like it. Like that it looks also. like it. Mm, and the red. cutouts. More Pilates before you do number 20. I know. <laughs> Midriff is literally <laughs> oh, everywhere. I can't bear it. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I cannot bear it. I like it. I do it... like the look of those trousers. They look like they're I think cool the trousers are one of the strongest things in it. But they do remind me of the Vuitton, you know, from the first Nicholas Gisquier collection with the big zip at the front and the top stitching. Maybe he was the one who made them. Yeah, exactly. That's what I like with this, though. But I think Nicholas Gisquier has, like, has been, you know, he goes to the show and it's like there is that obvious cross-pollination of ideas. I mean, that, yeah. Then for me, there's also quite a lot of kind of Helmut Lang feeling as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the kind of unusual materials and a lot of the, the silhouettes. And actually, the palette of this as well, the black, black, white and dark blue. I just, I just can't sit it in my head in terms of, I like it, but I can't see, I can't work out who the shopper is. You know, you can kind of imagine, I always think of like a basket and you can imagine someone having Prada and Marnie and I don't know, like, that, you know, you can group d- designers together. I find, maybe this is the strength of it, I find it hard to imagine who, who th- their woman is, you know, what tribe of woman is it that, that likes that and associates with it. But isn't that a symptom of... Our times also, there's so many designers. The calendars yeah. are absolutely packed. And there are very few that have a real point of difference. Because I mean, you want to think of it like that. You want to think of it as, as they get this woman who's obsessed with Paco Rabanne and only wears Paco Rabanne. Because it's kind of a cool story. Do you know what yeah. I mean, that idea? I mean, I think this, I think it's obviously they're aiming at somebody that's hardworking. That it's all done in flat shoes and boots. So there's yeah. this idea of practicality. And it's kind of sexy but hard working I mean I think there is you know some go getting late 20 something would have an amazing time in but then outfits. would they have the money for but it but I just I, yeah. I just think I'm seeing a kind I'm feeling that there's a kind of clash between who I'm imagining wearing these clothes and the kind of person that could actually afford to wear yeah. them yeah but I don't know in terms of it I, I, yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I think a lot of it is a working wardrobe, though. If you look, like, it's styled in this kind of useful, as you said, relatively 90s way, but a lot of what's in there is things that you could put together into a kind of relatively formal office wear. And it's interesting that it is casual. Like, it's very, very... Very sporty. Ca- so yeah. sporty. And if you think, you know, so much of what we see is cocktail wear and evening wear, and I think there's a massive gap for, for things, like, really beautifully designed... Like off, like things you can wear to the mm. office that are comfy and sporty. You know, you, you, London is just this like festival of cocktail dresses. So th- it's interesting for that. Except Lou, I mean, the funny that when I okay, so I live in Notting Hill Gate, and when I get a chance to kind of hang out in the street when all the 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 you know the people who don't work are hanging out, they're all wearing tracksuits. Yeah. And I spoke to an MA student at the Royal College of Art. We were having a coffee, and he had a Saturday job at Matches, and. I said to him, you know, I have a theory that, you know, these women's wardrobes have evolved into two things, tracksuits and cocktail dresses. Because yeah. after six, then do they just go wild? Yeah. <laughs> the <children laughs> comes out. When you say tracksuits, is it kind of like yoga wear? Kind well, of yeah. Yeah, stuff? yeah, but, yeah. you know, yeah. Lululemon, but then actual tracksuits and leggings. It's like yeah. they've yeah, all been sports. to the, you know, to the gym or, the, you yeah. know, and then they've got a parka. It's like a uniform. Yeah. And you go to any of those smart restaurants well, not in Mayfair, obviously, but, you know, yeah. you go to, 
you know, Notting Hill or Hampstead or any of those kind of residential smart areas. Yeah. That's what they're wearing. Well, it's interesting that Gucci did the, all the tracksuits. I thought they were amazing, you know. In and the, pajamas. Yeah, pajamas and tracksuits. Oh, well, you were really so right really on your nice. motocross. Yeah, I said motocross. Look at I that. Really that. Nice. Hot rod. That is cool. Those are really cool. I things. think what's interesting for this, though, is it's not... It, it, there is a kind of... Um, it's structured enough that it doesn't look kind of casual. It's not like, you know, the Marcus Almeida. It's not like, um, I think even the row feels a little bit like it's what you wear when you're not doing something. It's kind of to fill slots in your wardrobe. Whereas this feels like clothes to go somewhere. Is this right? Instagram we're looking at now? Yeah. Oh God, I like this so much better than looking at the show coverage out here. Can yeah, you yeah, really yeah. see it? So nice. It'd be interesting to see it on the red carpet. It is very helmet langy though. Mm. I'm a fan, I think. I like it because it doesn't feel like it's trying. Do you know what I mean? It feels like this is what he likes designing and this is how he's going to design it. When you, I feel like so many of the shows this season have been kind of embarrassingly try hard. You know, like all these Instagramable moments and like celebrities walking in shows and what have you. Whereas this, it feels like fashion. It definitely feels, and it, but it also very much feels like it's designed to be worn and it's yeah it's not headlines and maybe that's not what she eats them, I don't know yeah I don't know what that is it's can we go on the e-commerce site where that goes I love the big strap on the front mm. as well so are we impressed do we understand the buzz yeah <laughs> what I'm trying to figure out is I'm still yeah I, I'm with you actually I'm conflicted about who the customer is yeah I'm a bit concerned about the price point also because you know, there's there's a lot that's similar. Yeah. That is. You know, it's always from, that thing of why buy that not Celine? Yeah. Why buy that not? You have to kind yeah. of yeah. So. And you don't want it to feel if I had like to commit it's, a budget. I might be thinking a bit longer and harder. Yeah. About it. It's interesting because you don't want it to see because obviously going back to what we said at the very start about the perfumes is you don't want it to be one of those things where the fashion feels like it just doesn't exist or really go anywhere. You know, obviously. A lot of designers, Nicholas gets here included, when he gave that interview and left Balenciaga, talk about the frustration of not actually seeing kind of actual product yeah. that they're creating going anywhere or having any life beyond the runway. So in a way, this is good because it's doing that, but then you wonder how it's going to... What, what are your thoughts on it, Hetty? Well, we were talking before we went on air about what happened with Olivia Thayskins, uh, who was doing Nina Ricci underneath the same holding company, which is pronounced... Pooch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and how there was a you kind of a great double act. <laughs> <laughs> how there was this real disconnect between this absolutely extraordinary design and what they could actually sell and how they yeah. were marketing it, but also how it was very good for the perfume house. Um, I think that he's doing something that's extremely viable, but I just you know with Paula for that price, I don't know who's going to be buying. Who's it. going to buy it? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it kind of feels like we're coming to the conclusion that it's like one to watch. You know, it's like interesting to see it develop, which is exciting. I'm intrigued by what they're doing from all levels, from design down to this. Like, I find the four looks thing interesting and I I wonder how that's going to go. And I, I'm interested to see how the store develops and if it does become an interesting space. So maybe that's... Oh, the earrings look really cool. Mm, oh, they are good. nice. But I, that's what I think. It's like, why isn't that available to buy straight away? Do you know what I mean? That's because that's going to be so complicated. I mean, people always take for granted how easy it is to make jewelry. Yeah, that's it's, very true. There's reason it's on a much longer schedule than fashion. Yeah, the, yeah. the embroidered pieces are really cool. Which is it's interesting, actually, because I was saying that this kind of sits apart from what's happening at Gucci and all the romanticism in Milan, but actually that taps into that as well. Well, I want to see what happens next. I'm intrigued to see how it goes, but I think it's a beautiful collection. Should we give him a round of applause oh, to wrap yeah. things up?